from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. The sixth data platform or intelligent data platform represents a cutting edge evolution in data management. It aims to support intelligent applications through a sophisticated system that builds on a foundation of a cloud data platform. Now this foundation makes it possible to integrate data across different architectures and systems in a unified, coherent, and governed manner. Harmonized data enables applications to use advanced analytics, including AI, to inform and automate decisions. But importantly, a common data platform enables applications to synthesize multiple analyses to optimize specific objectives, ensuring, for example, that short-term actions are aligned with long-term impacts and vice versa. More than just a dashboard that informs decisions, this system increasingly incorporates AI to augment human decision-making or automatically operationalize decisions. Moreover, this intelligence allows for nuanced choices across various options, time frames, and levels of detail that were previously unattainable by humans alone. Hello and welcome to this week's The Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, George Gilbert and I will introduce you to Blue Yonder, a builder of digital supply chain management solutions that we believe represents an emerging example of intelligent data applications. And with us today to further understand and detail this concept and how it creates business value are Duncan Angov, Angov CEO and Salil Joshi, CTO of Blue Yonder. Gentlemen, welcome to Breaking Analysis. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Hi there. All right, before we dive in, we just want to frame the discussion with some of the key issues that we're going to address today. The practice of supply chain planning and management has evolved dramatically over the past couple of decades. And we're going to hopefully help you understand how legacy data silos are breaking down, how AI and increased computational capabilities are forging new grounds and the technologies that are enabling much greater levels of integration and sophistication in planning and optimization across the supply chain ecosystem. And we're going to try to address how organizations can evolve their data maturity to achieve a greater level of planning integration and how they can dramatically improve the scope of operations and their competitive posture. So guys, let's start by explaining the problem. Here's a graphic that we scraped from the Blue Yonder website. You guys will be familiar with it. The goal here is to optimize how to match supply and demand according to an objective, let's say profitability. And to do so, you need visibility on a lot of different parts of the supply chain. There's data about customer demand, different parts of an internal and external ecosystem that determine the ability to supply that demand at any given time. And the data in these systems has been historically siloed, resulting in friction, of course, across that supply chain. So Duncan, let's start with you. Can you just explain the challenge as you see it? And then Salil, feel free to chime in. Yeah, yeah thanks Dave. Jo George, great to see you guys again. Um, yeah, supply chain is arguably the most uh, complex and challenging of all the enterprise software categories out there just because it, by definition, it's supply chains or involves multiple companies um, versus one like an ERP or you know a CRM dealing with customers. And just the data and complexity of what you're dealing with when you think about if you're a retailer, SKU times lo location times day. So it's billions and billions of data points. And um, you know, so that that makes it very, very challenging. So you have to predict demand at the shelf, and then you have to cascade that all the way down a supply chain from the transportation, the trucks that get it there to the warehouse, inbound and outbound, back to the distributor, the manufacturer, that manufacturer, supplier, supplier, suppliers. So it's very, very complex in terms of how you orchestrate all of that. And it involves billions and billions of data points and extreme difficulty in orchestrating all of that across departments and across companies. And supply chain management, unlike other categories of enterprise software, has always been very fragmented uh, to the point that Dave made. And that means it's fragmented in terms of the data, the applications, a very diverse application topology, um, which means you have unaligned stakeholders uh, in a supply chain. Because of the volume that's involved here, it's generally been a very batch-based architecture versus sort of versus, you know, real time, which means there's a lot of date latency and moving data around, manipulating it and, and all of that. Um, and it's generally been limited by compute 
um, which means that there again, it's you know it's batch based and and companies generally trade out accuracy for time. It just takes too long be, because of the the compute and it's generally been very very hard to run in the cloud because it's mission critical. It requires instant response time. If you're trying to orchestrate a robot in an aisle in a warehouse, you know that requires instantaneous. Um, decisioning and and, um, and execution. So it's very, very challenging from that perspective. And, um, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's fundamentally a data problem and a compute problem. So that's how I would characterize it. Yeah, thank you, uh, Duncan. So Salil, it, it, data and compute, so the technical aspects are related to data management, presumably, and compute, latency, bandwidth. Can you boil down the many potential technical challenges into just a few? Yeah, so um, you know, if you think about supply chain problems and and uh, the functional silos that um, inherently supply chains is in the fairly static uh, nature of how supply chains have have been in place today, technology um, is such that we are that we we are able to solve a much larger problem than what we, we we used to in the past, right? Where we're basically saying that um, um, in the past, our ability to solve problems was limited by, to, to point Duncan May around the compute. Uh, we now have hyperscalers like Microsoft who are able to provide us an infinite compute, uh, are able through the uh, Kubernetes clusters that we have, uh, we are able to scale horizontally uh, and solve the problems that we frankly were not able to solve in the past five, 10 years. Uh, that the whole nature of uh, having a data cloud now available to us, uh, separating compute against uh, storage, that allows us to scale in a in a manner that is a lot more effective, cost effective, as well as ability to be a lot more real time than what we um, we were in the past. Uh, again, from a data cloud perspective, one of the things that um, that has always uh, bogged supply chain issues is integrations. If you think about all of the different systems that we need to have in place from an integration standpoint, data flows from one to another system, um, it, was, it was extremely complex. Now, what we have is um, ability uh, where we are able to materialize data in a much more seamless manner from one aspect of the supply chain to the other aspect so that visibility is there and the ability to then scale that um, beyond uh, what we had in the past is, is now evident. So for, for example, um, we partner with Snowflake and um, what we have leveraged there is this aspect of zero copy clones, which is really uh, an ability to materialize data, clone data without replicating it um, in um, over and over again. And as a result of which we can, uh, we can play out operational scenarios, figure out what is going on uh, in by move by by changing the levers and then choosing what is the most optimal answer that we want to get. So um, the the modern data cloud is helping us solve problems at a scale that we were not able to solve in the past. And uh, and finally, you know, adopting generative AI to really change the, the interface of how users have used supply chains in the past is also a very important aspect of how we, we solve supply chain challenges um, in the future. So uh, the, these are the various different technology advances that we see now that uh, we are able to use to solve some of the challenges that Duncan talks about uh, from a compute perspective and from a data uh, data integration perspective. So, um, Salil, let me just follow up on on one point. Duncan had talked about you know the scope of supply chains now, mm -hmm. and and when you're talking across companies in an ecosystem, 
even within a single company, all those legacy applications are silos. Mm -hmm. How do you harmonize the data so that your planning components are are essentially analyzing data where they the, the meaning is all the same? Right. So the first thing, first thing that has to happen is all these data, with, uh, all the data that is, you know, traditionally in supply chain data has been uh, kind of locked within application silos. And that has to come together meaningfully in what we call a single version of the truth. Have a single data model that is consistent across the entire enterprise, bringing that, uh, that the, 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 canonical data form in place such that we are able to define all of the atomic data and store the atomic data in a uh, in a single place in the right data warehouse on top of that then you need to establish or have what we are calling the logical data model, model or the semantic data model um, you know in some sense the enterprise knowledge graph where you have all the definitions of the supply chain for that particular enterprise defined in a very, very consistent manner, such that you have all the constraints defined in the right manner. Uh, you have all the objectives that are uh, that are connected in the right manner, and all of the uh, all of the semantic logical information that is needed for solving a, the. Uh, the pro supply chain problems consistently are available. So once you have the data in a single version of truth and then this logical data model, you can then have applications connect to each other in a meaningful manner where the where the inform not only the data but the context is also passed in a in a relevant manner. And and just really quickly to to clarify is that that knowledge graph is that implemented inside snowflake as a modeling a data modeling exercise or is that an ex, uh, sort of another technology that is almost like a a, a metadata layer outside the the, the data cloud it, it's it it, it it you definitely use snowflake uh, but uh, there is there is a technology that we have used above uh, snowflake on top of snowflake uh, you know um, a couple of couple of ways we have homegrown technology, but also leverage uh, um, a technology from uh, RAI uh, that builds the knowledge graphs to um, allow us to solve the larger complex uh, optimization problems. Okay, so Snowflake okay. is kind of the container. Go, to it, oh, go ahead, Doug, yeah, please. It, yeah, right. You're going right there, Dave. Right, it runs as a coprocessor and natively inside so Snowflake for those specific workloads is particularly good at solvers, LP, IP, all of that, and AI, but it runs in a container on site in Snowpark, right? So to all intents and purposes, it's native to Snowflake. Got it. And then and then there's some Blue Yonder IP, and like you said, relational AI, you put that together and you, you, mm -hmm. you can get the semantics. Right. Let's continue yeah. the discussion. We want to take a look at the way you guys think about solving this problem. We pulled a, what I would call a conceptual framework that describes your technology stack off your website. So the approach here is to gain visibility within all the parts of the supply chain, but you got to take an end-to-end -end systems view. Once you have visibility, you can harmonize the data, you can make it coherent, and then you can do analysis on not only the individual parts, but how they fit into the system as a whole and how all that those perspectives inform each other. And the point point is, this is an integrated analysis with a unified view of the data. You've got domain specific knowledge and then you contextualize that data, not just from an individual component point of view, but the, the entire system. So maybe you could explain how you guys think about your stack and how you think about solving this problem. Good, so you can take it. Okay, so um, we, we start off with uh, as I mentioned, the first thing is to have the data in the single version of the truth, right? Um, and establish that uh, in place, have the logical data model defined in a, in a, in a very dynamic manner. Um, so those are the two first building blocks of the, uh, of the piece. We also then have um, what we, what we call an event bus or because of the fact that, you know, Duncan mentioned this, that um, supply chains were, um, were traditionally in a batch mode. 
And um, now with the requirement for real-time responses, with the res uh, uh, requirement for uh, event-driven um, uh, responses, we have an event bus on which all of the supply chain events uh, get carried on, uh, carried through. And these events are then subscribed to by the various microservices that we play out across the entire spectrum of our, uh, of our supply chain. So uh, what will end up happening is uh, as an event uh, is coming through, whether it be a, um, a, a demand uh, signal, whether it be supply disruptions that are happening, these events are then uh, picked up by the various microservices in the on the planning side of the equation or the execution side of the equation, um, such that the appropriate responses are provided. And um, and not only that, once the the uh, event is is uh, treated, understood, reacted upon, then signals and actions are sent to downstream processes where um, the downstream processes then take, take that um, into account and then take it out into actioning and execution. So uh, that's the overall view that we are putting in place together where one, you have the data, the logical data, ability to um, take in events, understand what that event does from an insights perspective, create the actions that are required for downstream processes and make sure that those, uh, those actions are executed against. Once those actions are executed against, you get a feedback loop into your entire cycle such that you have continuous learning happening through the process. Okay, so um, let me just touch on on one thing or follow up on one thing, Salil. Um, you had mentioned agents earlier. Um, some of what we're we're learning about is that um, agents, the way we've seen them referred to so far, are sort of intelligent user agents, where they're sort of augmenting the user interface. But we're hearing from some people as well that some of the application logic itself is being learned in these, in these agents where um, we're used to having deterministic application logic specified by a programmer. But now the agents are learning the rules, um, I hate the word, but probabilistically. Yeah. And can you explain the distinction between an intelligent agent that sort of augments a user looking at a dashboard and then and an agent that actually is taking responsibility for a process. Yeah, uh, I'll give you an example of in, in the forecasting world, right? In the forecasting world in the past, we, we would forecast based on historical data and then say, uh, here is a deterministic calculation of what the forecast will look like from the history and you get a single number for it. And let's, uh, let's say, yeah, you know, the, the answer is X um, amount at a particular store at a particular time. Now, in the in in the in the new world, there is the you get multiple signals um, and which are causal in nature, right? There are some which are inherent within the enterprise, some that are market driven, and you need to kind of get a sense of. Um, what are the what are the causals, the probability of those causals to happen? And as a result of that probability, what is the range in which uh, a, if a, an outcome will, will take place? So for example, instead of having one number for a forecast, you now have uh, a probability curve on which this forecast is, available to you, where depending on the different causals that are out there, you will have uh, a different outcome. And what will end up happening is when you have that information uh, over a period of time, our systems will learn the, the manner in which these probability curves are taking effect in actuality. And those that those learnings will again make the system far more intelligent than what it is 
uh, it is today, right? And as a result of which you get start getting more and more accurate answers um, as the system learns. Duncan, it's it sounded good, like you had something. Yeah, to add. yeah, yeah. No, George, it's a very good question because is that fundamentally um, prediction and supply chain, and you know this is where the field of operations research started, the milk run, the beer run, solvers, which aren't sexy anymore because now Gen AI is what's sexy. And then you had deep learning, machine learning applied to it. And now there's generative AI. Those former things, to your point, are deterministic. Precision matters. It's mathematics, right? These are stochastic systems. Like hallucination here is good. It's called creativity and brainstorming, and it can write essays and generate videos for you. That's bad in a math world, right? And they're not good at math today. However, they're gonna get better and better and better. So when we think about intelligence, it's the combination of all of these things. We've got solvers that do a phenomenal job, for example, in the semiconductor industry. We ran the table last year because it does a very good job of that. We've got machine learning. We run 10 billion machine learning predictions a day in the cloud for fresh food, because it's very, very good at that, right? And then you've got generative AI, which is good at inference and creativity and problem solving. The combination of those three things we sort of refer to as the, the, the cognitive cortex, right? It's the combination of those three things which gives you a super powerful result. And then there's, there's tactical things like the token length of the field would be insane if we use Gen AI for forecasting. What are we going to do? Feed 265 billion data points into the prompt box? No, right? So what happens is as Salil was talking about this event-driven architecture, as events happen, that's a prompt. It goes into a prompt and Gen AI knows to call this solver to do this. And when it figures out what it should be doing, it calls an execution API, move a robot in a warehouse to pick more of this item, right? That's sort of how it hangs together. So you're kind of okay, using that... the Gen AI as the orchestrator of all this, and then you've got deeper right. ML. Can, can I add- And Dave, that's what we call it. We call it the Blue Yonder Orchestrator. Yeah, there you go. So, so I wonder if I could yeah. ask George, just a quick follow-up on that. Where do you guys land on, on the whole LLM situation? You're, you're, you're running an AWS, so you get presumably access to, 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 to Bedrock, you've got OpenAI and Azure and, and many other options out there. Llama 3 just came out and it's, it, it appears to be you know, very strong. Um, there are concerns about uh, open source licensing, uh, you, you've mm -hmm. got Snowflake just announced its own LLM called Arctic. Uh, where do you guys land on all this LLM diversity? We use them all, right? I mean, they're going to be just like a hyperscaler, a commodity. You know, I saw an analogy which says, you know, it wasn't the refrigeration guys that made the money, it was Coca-Cola, right? So, you know, we're Coca-Cola. And uh, so we look at all of them. We use, you know, Anthropic. We use OpenAI, obviously, because we have a huge stack on Azure. We use the open source things. We, we use all of them. Um, and we've actually tested each language model. There's a test that you take for certification and supply chain for practitioners. And we benchmark them all against that. And they were actually quite good, even without the fine tuning that comes with our intellectual property. So our belief there is much like debates that we've had in the past, Dave, right, about being multi-cloud or not. I mean, I think in LLMs, you probably need to be multi LLM. And there are some people that are actually trying to get results back from multiple LMs and then synthesize them for sort of the best answer. Yeah, that's that's the next wave. So that topic for another day, I guess, George, but you had a follow up, yeah. George. Yeah, um, Duncan, I'm curious about this. Maybe this is for both of you, but as the agents get better, or I should say as the as the foundation models get better at, at planning tool use execution, um, do you see them taking over responsibility for processes that you've written out in procedural code? Or do you see them um, sort of taking on workflows that you couldn't have expressed procedurally because there are too many edge conditions? I think it's a bit of both, George, right? Um, you know, so first of all, people are trying to use Gen AI to solve problems that have already been well solved by other technology, right? you know, whether it's ML or it's a solver or it's RPA, which isn't sexy anymore either, right? So, or enterprise search, like let's let's use it for what it's good at um, and understand the deficiencies it has right now. But though it, again, it'll, it'll get 
better and better. You know, our belief is, is that things that can be learned and are heavily language or document oriented are very right for this. That's why it's gone after law and all of this other stuff, right? It's easy to do that. Listen, supply chains run on documents, as you know, purchase orders, ASNs, bill of ladings, right? It's all that EDI stuff that we used to dread, right? Those are all documents, right? So there are things there that, that will be easier to do. Our belief is that that workflow type app, work kind of workflow applications where it's very forms based are at high risk of being displaced for sure. Planning is much, much harder. No one wants to look at a time horizon pivot table through a chat chatbot. I mean, no one, no one wants a chatbot on top of their Excel, right? You might want some generative AI embedded in cells and stuff like that, but those will be harder to go after, right? And they do require the intellectual property we have around solvers and ML and, and all of that. But ultimately, um, we're shipping agents that amplify all the different end user roles that we have, right? And for some of them, we'll go a long, long way to, re uh, to reducing the amount of work they have around repetitive stuff. There are some roles like super sophisticated planners and semiconductor, you know, where it's, it's harder, but there's still progress you can make there. But in the day, these things are just going to get smarter and smarter. I mean, let's be clear, the large language models today don't even learn. They, 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 memory is a new thing, right? So you would like yeah. to think that the longer an end user interacts with their own agent, it learns their style of working, it remembers context, and it just gets better and better and better and more useful over time. So, and it will happen a lot faster than we think. Yeah, and LLMs are almost the opposite these days. And so we have early days, as, as they say. And, by the way, George, the ETR impact, the data clearly shows exactly what Duncan's saying. If you, you saw things like RPA were well above the, the momentum line during COVID. And as soon as the, the chat GPT heard around the world hit, you saw that wane. So if those organizations that haven't, you know, those technology companies that haven't moved into more you know, end to end uh, automation uh, probably going to suffer. Um, and you were seeing that. You know, Dave, the, the funny thing is that they've done all the plumbing. I mean, I always say, you know, when you watch a movie and there's this evil AI and it's dystopian and, you know, it, it's um, it's super omnipotent and it's everywhere. It wouldn't be very, very evil and effective if it couldn't, if there wasn't a bridge from digital to the physical world. Like it could change a traffic, like make a lift or an elevator plummet or something like You have to be able to affect change in the physical world. And those are the execution systems, our warehouse management system, our transportation system, transmitting an order to a supplier. Like, so you need the bridge to the physical world, right? And the RPA guys put all that plumbing down. We've obviously done it. We've got thousands of APIs that make stuff move in the world, right? Move this truck from here, change the route, put these products on it. You know, so that's the other piece that's very important here. And for ChatGPT, it's like the API to booking a table on OpenTable or calling Instacart to buy stuff, right? At some point, something has to happen in the physical world. This is why we've been wanting to talk to you now for quite some time, because we we put forth this concept of the sixth data platform. Uh, we call it the Uber for everybody, which is you take people, places <laughs> and things, riders, drivers, ETAs, these are... These are things that people understand, uh, not necessarily that databases understand. How do you turn strings into things? And this is this is why we feel like supply chain, that connection between the digital and the physical world is such an interesting yet challenging example. So I, we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into the technical elements of the Blue Yonder solution and wonder if you guys could explain how these applications you deliver work together, You know, using that common view of data that we've been talking about. How do you integrate all the analytics such that the applications that have different details can can inform each other. Yep. So how about this, Salil? Yeah. Let me, I'll tee up the, the design, why, what the design objectives were and how what's happening in the world shaped it. And yeah. then Salil can bring it to life with the application and tech footprint and some examples. Sure. So you know, no one knew what a supply chain was before COVID. It's funny, when something breaks, people suddenly recognize there was something doing something. And, um, but reality is we're going through a generational shift in supply chains we haven't seen in 30 years or 40 years. You know, for the last decades, it's been about globalization and productivity. And let's use China as the world's factory and then ship stuff everywhere. And the philosophy was all around just in time. Okay, those two things kind of did it. And, there is so much disruption happening now. The rewiring from China, the reshoring of manufacturing, the friend sourcing, there's sustainability, there's e-commerce, there's demographic time bombs with labor shortages, right? 
There's, you know, the impact of climate change, the Panama Canal, the Mississippi River, you know, global instability, the Houthis, you name it, right? We've never seen it like this. So JP Morgan did a report of 1,500 companies in the S&P, and in the last two years, working capital has increased by 40%. That's inventory. It's staggering, right? That's money that isn't being invested in growth or in the consumer. It's sitting on someone's balance sheet. That can't be the answer to resiliency. The answer is software and reimagining how a supply chain should run with software. And what companies need is agility. They need the ability to aggressively respond to risk and opportunity, and they need to be fully optimized, right? So the things that you need technically there is you need visibility. It's hard to be agile if something hits you at the last minute, right? You need to be able to see there's a supply disruption. Today, it takes on average four and a half days for a company to learn of a disruption in supply, okay? That doesn't work. You can use prediction and AI. I can predict that I have a supply issue, that this order is going to be late, that this spike in demand is going to be happening. So agility is critical and it's fueled by technology, right? Um, the second thing is how do you aggressively respond? It's very hard in supply chain to do that because everyone's siloed. You need everyone coordinated to go solve a problem. The logistics people that are, that are scheduling trucks need to talk to the people in the warehouse, in the store, the people that are figuring out what to buy. Like that has to operate as one and it doesn't today because it's in silos and all the data is fragmented in every way. So you need, that's the second thing. And then to be fully optimized across all of that, you need infinite compute and you need unified data and you have to get out of batch and you have to connect the decisioning systems, which is planning to the execution systems. Those are the things that, that, that you need. That design point actually describes an intelligent data app. Yeah. That's exactly what solves yeah. this, right? So Salil, that, that's the design point we went on. Yeah. So and Salil, before you jump in, let me just let me just um, add context to to what I hope will be your answer, which is um, now take that amazing setup that Duncan gave, and maybe give us an example of a of a use case of of a supply chain where there is an unanticipated disruption, and you need to replan so that the sh you're you're changing both your long term plans and your short-term yeah. plans. And, and you wanna harmonize all those things and then drive execution systems with a new set of plans. Yeah, so uh, take for example, um, a, a, a large order has just come into your laps. Um, you had a system that that was, you had, you had a plan in place, that plan has be, had been sent to your warehouses, um, the, the logistic systems and all of that is in place and it's in motion. And a large order that has come in and, and preempted, right? This preemptive order now has come in um, is one, there is a order reprioritization that has to happen. Once that order reprioritization has happened, it has to then go into your execution systems where now suddenly the warehouses have to be aware of the fact that, oh, now I have my my pick cycles have to change. Uh, my uh, my uh, my shipping has to change. The logistics uh, plan that was in place and was in execution has to change. And today, as Duncan mentioned, these signals, are not in real time. These signals happen in a, in a batch environment. So uh, what ends up happening is you're not able to respond to this large order that has come in. So what we have start putting uh, have started putting together is this interoperability, as we call it, or the connection across the various different um, uh, systems, where an all the way from the planning side of the equation to the execution side of the equation, there is a connection. Now the interoperability in this most basic form could be just data integrations, right? But that is not good enough. The data integration then the, the level of, uh, uh, of evolution is to say, now I have workflows that I have established that are able to connect the, the different changes that, that the the uh, start point of the disruption and all of the uh, consequences downstream into the system have have connected by a workflow basis the final evolution of that is that i'm able to orchestrate 
all of the pieces of the puzzle that I have within the supply chain together and optimize it together. So that is that is really the nirvana that uh, um, you you draw into. Duncan, you were gonna you were gonna add how how yeah I mean just, how someone just a re really, replan yeah just a, yeah just a really simple example right you know so companies spend so much time and intellect on the plan it's the probably the smartest people it's where the AI is there's all this manipulation to get it there right and it doesn't survive the day right you release it out go pick these orders we forecast the demand at the store all of that and what you know is the robot goes down an aisle and by the way we've not just planned the perfect order we've We've optimized it in transportation. The load is full. The whole thing is beautiful, right? A robot goes down an aisle and the inventory is damaged for one of the items that have to go on the truck. And what happens today is that truck goes out without those orders on it and we short ship a store because there's no closed loop feedback. There's no event, anything, right? What happens in the future world is the robot goes down there. It immediately communicates that order item number seven is not available. It calls an order sourcing engine, fix is that it can pick up from another DC, commu communicates back to the planning system. The planning system says, put this order on that truck instead. It calls load building, re-optimizes the load, and that truck goes out full, right? Full, and the order is satisfied. All of that happens in seconds, right? When you connect all of this stuff in, in real time and you have infinite intelligence. By the way, it's also a more sustainable order. You sent out a less than full truckload in the previous example. So this is also more sustainable. And that same, you know, we, obviously we announced the signing of one network last month, which takes that same value proposition across a multi-tier network. So the same example could have been where instead of an order, not instead of the inventory being damaged in an aisle, it could be a supplier communicating to you, hey, we can't fulfill this order. You automatically find an alternate supplier. It calls the carrier. The carrier won't tend to the load unless it knows the dock door available, calls the dock door system. Yes, the door's available. Yes, well, and the whole thing is just orchestrated, right? So... So planning becomes a real-time decisioning engine. The whole thing is event-driven, right? So it's um, it's more sustainable, it's more efficient, it's more resilient. Glad you brought up okay. sustainability. There's so much to this topic. Sustainability, we really, we're really we not really talking much about IoT and the edge and inference. Uh, but that's another sort of topic that we'd love to have you guys back to explore. Uh, George, I wanted to do some final thoughts and then let you ask some other questions. But if you had a follow-up here, go for it. I, I think that that kind of distilled, this is the best sort of use case, application use case that, that we've had for this intelligent data platform, which is once you know, you've know you got this data harmonized from all these different sources, even outside the boundary of a company, you know, then you, you harmonize the meaning, um, the technology seems to be a, a knowledge graph. It, it's not clear to us actually how, how else you can do it other other than embedding the logic in a bunch of data transformation pipelines, which is not really shareable and reusable. But then once you've got that that data that's harmonized, you have visibility and then you can put analytics on top. But it's not one analytic engine, it's many analytics harmonizing mm -hmm. different points of view. And then whether it's through RPA or transactional connectors, that's how you then drive operations in legacy systems. That's the connection between the intelligent data platform driving outcomes in the real world. If I'm trying to that's sort of that. recap what, what you guys have yeah. said. That's right. And there's actually another sort of sick element to this, George, right? Which is it also changes the way enterprise software is deployed. Okay. So the way you normally deploy a planning system is you have to go and use ETL from all these disparate databases and applications. You batch load it into the plan and then you do a bunch of planning and, and all of that. In the new world, I mean, just say half our customers at least use SAP. Most of that's the planning data that we need. They've already got it in Snowflake. We go to the customer and we say, can you give us read access to these fields? We don't move the data. We run the intelligent data app natively on it. There's no migration. There's no integration. There's nothing. The knowledge graph provides context and allows us to understand what it is. Oh, wait a second. We want to grab some weather causals. Snowflake Marketplace, the data is already in the unified cloud. We're not moving anything. We're just doing a table join. Oh, the CPG company would like to see what that gross has planned. Oh, you've got your CPG data as hell. Hey, there's a there's a there's a join between the CPG data and our data and the causal data, and we run our forecasting engine on top of it. It's game changing. You move the applications and the process to the data. You don't do the opposite, right? So the speed at which you move is dramatic. 
We've deployed all of our intellectual property as microservices on the platform. It's a forecast as a service. It's a load build as a service. It's slotting optimization in the warehouse, right? So these are all intelligent data apps sitting on unified data. And that data, data could be anywhere, right? Um, it could be an object store on-prem. Uh, it could be in an iceberg table. Is that, is that right? Is that the way you're thinking about it? Well, ultimately you move it to the data cloud. Everyone has their data in one data cloud. That's the premise of Snowflake and 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 guys like Databricks and others. So it does necessitate the data is all in Snowflake, correct? Yes, it requires it to be in the data cloud, correct. Okay, interesting. George, any other thoughts before we wrap? Um, no, this was this was um rather enlightening. It's a it's a sort of a real life use case, as I guess I was saying before, of of everything we've been talking about. Yep. We've been in search we of the, the six data platform for, uh, for a little bit, so appreciate you guys coming out. I want to summarize, and then I'm going to ask you guys for some final thoughts. You know, supply chain is a great example, as we just heard, of this challenging intelligent data application because there's so many moving parts. Uh, there's a lot of technical legacy debt which you guys are, are abstracting away, uh, and really we emphasize to take advantage of these emerging platforms. You got to get your data house in order. So you can integrate the data, make different data elements coherent, i.e. harmonize the data. And we're taking a system view here. Oftentimes managers are going to maybe do a great job of dressing a bottleneck or optimizing their piece of the puzzle. And for example, they might dramatically improve their output but only to overwhelm some other part of the systems and bring the whole thing to its knees, essentially just moving the deck chairs around or maybe worse. And finally, with Gen AI, every user interface uh, surface is going to be enhanced with intelligent, an agent technology. It's going to reduce cycle times over time, dramatically simplify supply chain management. And in this example, yes, supply chain, but also, also all enterprise applications. And a very powerful takeaway from today is the answer to business resilience is not excess inventory, it's better software. It's the intelligence data platform. So, right. so Leo, uh, give us your final thoughts and then Duncan, and then we'll wrap. Sure. Um, so uh, I would like to say with the availability of technology now that uh, on our hands, whether it be MLAI, whether it be the infinite compute, whether it be the platform data cloud, whether it be now generative AI, uh, this whole notion of the end-to-end, -end, the whole notion of the connected supply chain, the, the ability to have that visibility, ability to orchestrate across the entire uh, spectrum is companies will now be able to start measuring at a very different level the objectives and the metrics than what they have done in the past. No longer are you going to talk about uh, cost per case at a warehouse, you're going to talk about cost to serve at a customer level, right? So it's going to be very different moving forward with these technologies at play. Uh, with the kind of superpowers that these systems are going to provide, the software is going to provide, uh, the essential uh, supply chain operator role is going to change it drastically. Um, we, we call them, uh, our, our su supply chain operators will become superheroes. Um, the notion of, um, you, you touched upon this uh, around sustainability and ESG, there is not going to be just metrics and measures that are reports uh, somewhere in the, um, um, down in, in, the, in the dungeons, but it is really going to be part of the uh, the optimization solve and get better answers to this. So com companies will become that much more competitive because of the fact that we have these um, these software supply chain applications in place. And that's where that's the excitement of uh, pivoting to this new transformation. Yeah, indeed, thank you, uh, Duncan. Bring us home, please. Yeah, I like to, I like the way they paraphrased it. You know, the way to solve resiliency is not is not inventory; it's software, and that's exactly what we've built. Um, you know, next generation solutions that allow companies to be more agile, aggressively responsive, and fully optimized, and you know, all built in sort of what we think is the next generation enterprise software stack, was the intelligent data apps, and um, that's what we've built. So, you know, we're living in a moment in time where supply chains have never been. Um, more uncertain. 
and transformations required, just like we just lived through the last 20 years of digital transformation, which was sort of consumer driven, you know, we're seeing the same necessity now around supply chains. So, so thank you very much for having us on. As always, really enjoyed the chat. You guys asked very insightful questions. Hey, you bet, and, and fantastic example and, and really appreciate your time. Love to have you back at some point in time. Uh, okay, that's it for now. Thanks to Alex Myers and Ken Schiffman on production and do our podcast, Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight help get the word out on social media. And Rob Hof is our editor in chief over at siliconangle.com. We publish every week on siliconangle.com, thecuberesearch.com. Remember all these episodes, they're available as podcasts. Just search Breaking Analysis Podcast. Email me, david.vellante, siliconangle.com. DM me uh, at dvellante. Comment on our LinkedIn post. Check out etr.ai for all the survey data. This is Dave Vellante for the Cube Research Insights, powered by ETR. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.